I actually want to go see the movie. I remember the game, but I really like The Rock, and he's very charismatic. Holy shit! Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome to another episode of Spitting Venom, aka The Venom Blog. And today, we are beginning our countdown to CinemaCon with some information on some of the characters that we know to be in the movie and that are going to be played by actors that have already been announced who they're playing. So, throughout the week, uh, leading up to next Monday, April 23rd, you know, Sony has a panel at CinemaCon. Hopefully, they're going to talk about more Venom stuff, uh, drop maybe another trailer on us, something. I'm sure something will come from this event. And if you want to know what we speculated on, definitely check out my my previous video uh, which is called countdown to CinemaCon and check that out and let us know your theories in the bottom uh, in the comment section and then any any videos I make this week put your theories in the comment section of what you think we'll see at CinemaCon and what you hope to see and I will do a video on Saturday where I read some of those and respond to them uh, but today what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a look at one of our the main character of the movie which is Eddie Brock we know Tom Hardy is gonna be playing Eddie Brock in this film that's already been announced we also know Anne Wang is gonna be played by Michelle Williams and Dr. Carl and Drake is going to be played by Riz Ahmed and we know the Life Foundation is like the main villain of the film uh, along with Dr. Carlton Drake so we'll get to each of those characters and that that company later on in the week but today we're just going to start with good old Eddie Brock uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about you know his background his history uh, obviously if you want a full history of the character and you want to know a lot more details of what I'm going to go over today check out the link in the description box it's going to be to Eddie Brock's Wikipedia page and there's a bunch of stuff on there for those of you who are like you know no casual information or might know all of the information might know the full story whatever you want I'll have everything down below because we're not going to cover everything today what I want to give you guys is just kind of like my take on the character and also like what you know what writers and artists have perceived him as and portrayed him as over the years uh, and this character is a very uh, he's a lot more in depth I think than a lot of people think you know when people think of this character I think they just think oh he's a big guy with muscles and he's a monster and he's kind of one-dimensional and that may have been true maybe towards the beginning and maybe in the you know the beginning phases of, of you know evolving the character but quickly I feel like that character became something more it transcended the page in a lot of ways and Eddie Brock and Venom uh, particularly the combination of the two uh, they became fan favorites instantly I mean they, there was no denying it this was selling Spider-Man books this was helping sales on that book and it was getting people and fans excited for this new villain this new character and it was something different and something that had a grudge and something it was a personal story but it was also something new and uh, it tied back into like you know great dramatic stories like the death of Anne Wang or not the death of Anne Wang sorry uh, it, it tied back into dramatic stories like uh, the death of Gene DeWolf uh, Anne Wang does die but she dies much later on uh, so it, and it, it opened the way to tell uh, very different Spider-Man stories for a while and it had Spider-Man really like always be the underdog he was every time he was fighting Venom he was punching up I mean he he had to really try to outthink him try to outfight him uh, try to do whatever he could against someone who was a lethal lethal foe against him uh, so Eddie Brock you know he first appeared in a cameo in a way in Web of Spider-Man number 18 Peter Parker is like hanging out and he's uh you know at, at like a subway train waiting for the subway car to show up and he gets pushed by a mysterious hand he gets pushed out in front of the subway train and his spider sense never goes off and so immediately you're like oh whoa okay so there's a maybe a new threat coming what's going on he got pushed and it never set off a spider sense what's going on and then a couple issues later in another book uh what happened is he's swinging and a hand uh, covered in black reaches out and like grabs him and knocks him off his like you know web swing and so again you're like okay what is this like what is this enemy and how are they able to get a one-up on spider-man so they did a really good job slowly building him and making you like you know just have like one page of a couple spider-man books for a couple months doing this and having spider-man being terrorized in some way and what we find later in you know by other issues written by david michelini who him and todd mcfarlane along with a history of other writers and creators all kind of came up with venom together uh it's really hard to say venom was created by just david michelini and todd McFarlane but they are the main creators of the character they're the ones who kind of forged him uh, in the comic book and but they those forging and what they created did come from other people's work it was felt like a very organic growth so to say you know Venom is created by one person or two people is kind of true but also there's more to it so again I'll have that full story all down in the you know in the description box check out the Wikipedia page it'll tell you all about you know how Marvel bought the drawing of Venom or the black suit 
off of a fan that lived in like Illinois for 220 bucks. And then they went off and they made that character, you know, uh, into the black costume for Spider-Man. Uh, and it was based off an idea that was going to be in an Iron Fist book where Iron Fist costume kept self regenerating. Cause everyone was like, Hey, how does his shirt rip? And the next issue is shirts back. Does he know how to sew? And he's like, you know what? I'm going to come up with a suit that like, you know, can shift and unstable molecules kind of like the fantastic four and re, you know, re, re, re uh, you know, sew itself or fix itself. And they decided not to do that idea in Iron Fist and it was used in Spider-Man for the black suit and it was one of the powers they gave the black suit. Uh, so that, you know, all that ideas, all that eventually evolved into Spider-Man getting rid of it, you know, it being an alien from another planet, from Battle World, all these different writers and artists having hands on it, and then ending up in Amazing Spider-Man issue 298 and two, 298, 299, and 300. And 300 is the first real appearance of Venom in full. Uh, uh, you get uh, Eddie Brock as Denim terrorizing Spider-Man, fighting him on the church where he was created and getting the exposition in the background of who he is. You know, he's like, hey, I was a journalist when Gene DeWolf died and the Sin Eater was out there. You know, he was a serial killer that was terrorizing New York. He killed Gene DeWolf. And uh, and then I was in touch with a guy, at, you know, you know, he was working for Eddie Brock was working for a newspaper called the Daily Globe, not the Daily you know, Bugle, but the Daily Globe. And uh, he was working for them and he was a rising star over there. And he was, you know what, I'm making a name for myself. I'm interviewing the guy who's a sin eater. And then eventually what happened is he was, you know, being accused from people who were saying that he was, you know, making it up and all this other stuff. So he decided, to, you know, decides to out the sin eater and say, hey, here's the name of the guy that I've been interviewing, Emil Gregg. This is him he's the sin eater but what happens is spider-man actually catches the real sin eater and exposes him in a story that ends up in the daily bugles newspaper and it makes the daily globe look like a laughing stock and it makes them fire eddie brock and then eventually i think the, the company and the the newspaper go out of business uh because they never really are able to bounce back from you know what happened to their newspaper and their, their reputation so eddie brock tries to explain himself as a sympathetic guy. Hey, I was on the rise. I was doing my job. I was an investigative journalist. I did everything right. And then you came along and ruined everything. And then on my on the night where I was, you know, at my lowest and I was going to go commit suicide, I'm Catholic. I grew up Catholic. I went to church to pray uh, for the strength, I guess, to, to go through with it and ask God for forgiveness because I'm about to kill myself. And that was the same church as fate would have it that Spider-Man was in and he removed the black costume and it drips down from the church bells, uh, weakened and angry at Spider-Man and finds someone else uh, coincidentally, and also, like I said, by fate and destiny, find someone else who also hates Peter Parker and merges with Eddie Brock, giving him knowledge, not only of battle world and, uh, the Clintar race and the symbiote, and it's feeding all this, you know, uh, life and, you know, everything and all these memories into his mind. But in those memories also is the true identity of Spider-Man. And he tells him who Spider-Man is. It's Peter Parker. And they together decide to bond, merge, and come up with a way to get revenge. So Eddie Brock, you know, a lot of people think, oh, he was a really sympathetic guy in the beginning. And he was a guy who was just trying to, you know, he keep his head down, blue collar, try to work his way up, and then just got some information wrong and, you know, and got tossed out. That is true coming from Eddie Brock, you know, so you, you got to take that with a grain of salt. This is the guy who is the bad guy of the story who ends up terrorizing Mary Jane Watson, goes to threaten her at Peter Parker's house. He crosses a lot of lines, you know, uh, hints at maybe hurting Aunt May. I mean, this guy is really all out nasty. He kills security guards and, and police officers and he's killing people but he's saying he wants to protect the innocent he wants to protect everyone from spider-man but he's definitely broken inside and there's a lot broken about him and that doesn't just happen overnight that is a, a pattern that typically evolves and that is something other writers came in and tried to add to like zeb wells with dark origin uh, i know a lot of people don't like that story and they think it messes with continuity a lot and they think it paints eddie in a negative light it kind of does, but intentionally. I think Zeb Wells was intending to uh, paint Eddie Brock in a negative way and show that, you know what, this guy does have an opportunistic side. He does have, uh, he's a habitual liar. Um, he understands when people are lying and that's why he's a habitual liar is because he knows what it takes to sell a good lie because he lies all the time. And when someone lies, he can tell because he does it all the time. Um, and so he kind of paints him in that way. And I know a lot of people don't like that, but it is a take that that writer, you know, did. And it is technically canon. Uh, Dark Origin is definitely part of this, the Venom canon. And that is being reprinted. It'll be coming out this fall. And it does... I think it goes too far in some ways with Eddie Brock and making him an irredeemable guy. 
Uh, but again, if you go back and look at those early comics, he was pretty irredeemable at the beginning too, uh, with the way he hurt people and the, the lengths he was willing to go to just to get Spider-Man. Uh, he literally didn't care about anything. He had blinders on when he saw Spider-Man and he would hurt anyone in his way. And that makes him very dangerous and that makes him, you know, not very sympathetic. And it wasn't until they were building up to the Carnage storyline where he started to see a little bit of humanity in him. And then once Carnage came along, that was an easy flip uh, switch that they could flip to make him more of an anti-hero because they were like, hey, we already started laying the groundwork. We try to add some more of his backstory and his history and showing that he's a misunderstood guy and that, you know, even though he has done some wrong, there is a chance that maybe he can redeem himself. And then once Carnage shows up, that was his opportunity. That was the time where he could go, you know what? I can redeem myself now. I can do the right thing and help Spider-Man take down Carnage. And it's only when Spider-Man betrays him in that story that he decides to continue to be a villain to Spider-Man. And it's not till later on when Spider-Man helps Venom save Anne Weying, his ex-wife, Eddie Brock's ex-wife, it's not till then that they're able to form a, a temporary bond and friendship to the point where Eddie says, look, I'm going to go back home to San Francisco where I'm from. You help me save my ex-wife. I owe you for that. So for that, I'm going to go my way. You go your way. And that's that's how this is going to end. And so for a while, that worked. But eventually, they became enemies again. Uh, so And for for valid reasons, if you're looking at it through Eddie Brock's eyes. So Eddie Brock, I, I think he, you know, he's always been a broken person. In Dark Origin, they reveal that he was, as a young kid, his, you know, he his mom passed away during complications of childbirth for him. So when she had him, she died soon after. And it's something his father always kind of, hated about Eddie, you know, kind of blamed Eddie. And even in the book in Dark Origin, you know, Eddie's like, yeah, he's, start, he's like 10 years old. He's starting to figure out how people lie. And, you know, even he himself, he like steals a neighbor's cat. And then, because he likes the girl, and then when she says, I can't find my cat, he brings it back to her and says, hey, look, I found your cat. And uh, and they established that he grew up Catholic, that he has a sister, which was something that was mentioned in one of the other books in the 90s. I think it was like Nova or something. Someone commented that recently in the comment section. Um, I think it was Swordsman, so shout out to Swordsman 100. And uh, and so there's, you know, he, he kind of had this broken childhood where his dad never accepted him. And every time he tried to appease his father, his father still didn't accept him. And when he his dad says, look, you know, his sister's like antagonizing Eddie. And she says, you're the reason mom died. And his father, you know, says, steps in and says, hey, don't say that about your brother. That he's He has nothing to do with your mom's death. I don't blame him for that. So, you know, don't say horrible things like that. And then the father leaves and Eddie says... Oh man, and she's like, what are you so mad about or sad about? Dad just defended you. And he goes, no, but dad's lying. I can tell. So you can see right early on that that the, Eddie had no chance. He probably had no chance to be a truly good person uh, because he that support system was never there for him. He had a sister that gave him a hard time. He feels responsible for the death of his own mother, even though, of course, that was not his fault. And, uh, and then you have his father who never accepted him. So he went and tried to become a brainy kid and get good grades. That didn't impress his father. He started working out and, and trying to you know pretend like he was part of a sports team uh, at school. That didn't impress his father. Uh, then he started getting to journalism and wanted to expose people who were lying and wanted to tell the truth. And that seemed to give him a nugget that maybe his father was interested uh, based on a couple lines that they exchanged with each other during the Watergate scandal once that comes open. And Eddie's like, oh, I think that guy's lying. And his dad's like, you know what? I think you're right. And then when the truth comes out about Watergate, I think it gave Eddie an, an in. And he said, you know what? This might impress my father. This might get him to like me. So when he goes out there and he becomes a journalist, he tries to do his best job. He is, you know, fudging facts. If you watch like, you know, the, the Sam Raimi, the third movie, uh, if you watch the short film that we watched recently called Truth and Journalism, those are, I think, pretty interesting takes on Venom because they're and Eddie Brock because it shows that he's willing to fudge things to set the truth, to to frame the truth, uh, to in order again, just all comes back to a little boy trying to impress his father. So I kind of believe, even though a lot of those aren't canon and a lot of those aren't accepted by fans, it makes it's a it's a pattern that makes sense to me from as a writer myself and as an editor, as someone who's looking for a through line with this character. Now, whether we're going to see this level of depth and and stuff brought into the new movie i don't know you know tom hardy it looks like this movie obviously spider-man's not going to be there probably not the sin eater story either it looks like tom hardy based off that one image we saw is investigating the life foundation and to me they seem like a big enough corporation that could probably ruin his life if he digs too deep and that's really all you need the impetus for his character is that someone needs to ruin his life he wants to get revenge on someone and then he gets the alien symbiote and then he gets revenge so if the life foundation has a symbiote if they're torturing it if they're running experiments on it and it doesn't like it and then Eddie Brock, you know, it gets his life ruined. 
If the two merge, they have a common enemy and it'll lead them to the Life Foundation. So to me, you can tell a Venom story without Spider-Man, despite what a lot of people think out there, because those are really only his motivations. And if you can do that with in this storyline, in this movie, uh, if you can paint it and frame it the way I just said, then it'll it'll work and the character will still come across the way he's meant to come across. So uh, so yeah, I mean, he's had, a, he's had a rough life, Eddie Brock, and he becomes sympathetic. I think Dark Origin adds more sympathy to a story, even though it does make him even more irredeemable in some ways. You know, it still paints a picture of a young kid who probably just didn't stand a chance, didn't have any hope to become a good person, didn't have the upbringing Peter Parker had. Uh, so again, showing the, the dark mirror that he is of Peter's life. Peter lost his parents at a young age, but had a good support system with Aunt May and Uncle Ben. And Eddie Brock lost his mother at a young age, but did not have that strong support system with his sister and his father. So again, I, I like that. I think the duality is there. I think it makes him even more the anti-Spider-Man, the, you know, the anti-hero in a lot of ways. And it, it gives you something to grow with. And, and if he does cross lines, it gives him a place to try to come back from. And, uh, and I think, you know, if they explore at least a fraction of this in the movie, they could end up with an interesting character and an interesting take on the character in this movie. So when I, when I hear people say, oh, Venom's just two dimensional or one dimensional even, and he's not a very deep character, I, I say to them that maybe they just haven't read enough of the Venom comic or pulled it or extrapolated enough uh, the way I do uh, to try to find the potential in the character. And I think there's a ton of potential in the character. And you'll see as we keep doing this show and as we keep going forward, there's other versions of Eddie Brock we'll talk about. There's uh, you know him becoming other symbiotes, like he becomes you know, anti-Venom for a while. He becomes a character named Toxin for a while. Uh, there's other avenues for him to go before he comes back to being uh, you know Eddie Brock Venom again in the comics, which he currently is and a lot of people want to bring up the cancer factor in that in the movie it looks like he's in an MRI and he might be getting treated for cancer I don't think that's the case with the movie I think he goes into the MRI because he gets the symbiote and he notices he's twitching and he's having you know issues you saw him like walking on the street walking up to the hospital and he's like moving around and twitching I think that's all leading up to him trying to figure out what's wrong with him what's going on maybe he fell in the water like when he's being chased in the woods or maybe he you know, ends up with the symbiote somehow and he doesn't know how he got it. So he goes to an MRI machine, which shoots out radio waves for those who don't know. Um, and, uh, and MRIs, I've been in a bunch of them myself for aneurysm stuff, like getting tested and in, in the MRI, it'll shoot radio waves. And obviously radio waves would irritate a symbiote. So when he's in there and he's screaming at the camera ah, and the suits coming up his neck, you know, that would be really cool if the next scene is the MRI just exploding and the suit, you know, him coming out in full venom galore, you know, and he's just like, he's like screaming and just screeching through the halls and busting through walls and things like that. Um, that would be really cool. And that would make sense considering that's what an MRI would do to the symbiote because its weaknesses are fire and sound waves and a couple other things. So yeah, I mean, the character of Eddie Brock, that's kind of who he is to me. That's kind of my take on him uh, based on stuff that was written about him in the comics and in, uh, you know, in other movies and other things like that and fan films and stuff. And, uh, and I, I think there's a lot to this character and I'm glad he's getting his own movie. And, you know, I know a lot of people out there aren't very excited about this movie. I'm getting excited. I mean, I've been excited since we started this show and it's the reason why I do this show is because I am excited. I, I have hope that this could be a good take on the character because I believe there's potential there for a solo Venom movie that could work. But I know not everybody feels that way and I know they're gonna need more trailers and more information to convince them of that. And uh, and that's cool and I'm very patient, uh, but I hope next week at the CinemaCon panel from Sony, I hope we get some news and I hope I can share it with you guys uh, at that time. So. Let me know what you think. Do you have a favorite Eddie Brock moment? Do you have a favorite Venom moment? Um, do you have a, any information about Venom that I didn't cover that you think defines the character really well? Let me know in those comments down below. As always, I really appreciate you guys watching my channel. The next episode, we will talk about Anne Wang, uh, Eddie Brock's ex-wife. We will cover her and Michelle Williams in the next episode, so I hope you guys join me there for that. And if you like the show, like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff. And as always, I'll see you in the future. Peace.